Hello and welcome to PM Personality Profile. My name is Nana Ansakwa the fourth. As you know, every Friday, you know, we'll come to you with a different personality. Indeed, it then changes from current affairs and then we delve into the skin of our guests to try and know, you know, what fabric that it is that made them. Today I'm here to talk to a man who I've admired from far and close. Someone, I can say he's my friend. You know, I really admire him for his philosophy, his depth of knowledge in Islam will just mind boggle you. And I'll tell you something that I've always quoted, even though I haven't always given credit to him. He says the man who goes to his God and puts on his hat is no less than a man who goes to his God and takes off his hat. And I think it's such a profound statement when you look at diversity and this universe. Folks, today I'm here to talk to Dr. Mustafa Hamid. Yes, doctor. You probably just call him Mustafa Hamid. PhD older Mustafa Hamid. When I come back, we're going to talk about a diverse, diverse conversation to find out why it is that the right wing politician is in love with such a strong wing, left wing politician. It should be a very interesting conversation. Don't go. We're coming straight back. Well, thank you very much for staying. You know, obviously the interesting part when we get the conversation going. And this is going to be one of those selfish interviews. You know, I really want to know for myself who this man is and what is it that he's made of. Doc, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you, sir. <laughs> We are so used to calling you Mr. Fahami, Mr. Fahami, that the, now it's even bigger than the doctor. <laughs> I, I, I personally am unable even to, to refer to myself as PhD. <laughs> I, I still prefer to call myself Mustafa Abdul Hamid. I guess you branded your name too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. And also that, you know, quite frankly, really, um, there's this Muslim philosopher and saint called Ibn Sina. Mm -hmm. In, in Western philosophy, they call him Avicenna. Hmm. When you see Avicenna in most of the books, it's actually Ibn Sina. Okay. And Ibn Sina said that he learned all the sciences by age 18. And then beyond 18 years, he never really learned anything new. You know? <laughs> in other words, the point that I'm trying to make mm. is that I, I don't believe that um, referring to me as doctor really has added in a storehouse of knowledge that, that I didn't know before. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the requirements of academia that at a point you have to write a certain thesis, mm -hmm. you know, to be, to be awarded a certain title. So You've defended it, right? Absolutely. I, uh -huh. I did the defense 20th December um, 2017. I was given a month to incorporate the suggestions that were made at the defense and do the final submission. All that has been done. Yeah. I'm just waiting for the formal ceremony where I would go and wear the gown and, and take the pictures. You've been saying I was saying nothing more, but it's <laughs> <laughs> just ceremonial. But no, let me stay on it a bit. I mean, Islam and gender in, in, in Dagbon, that's an interesting topic. Yes, it is. You don't make it easy for yourself, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I like um, controversy hmm. some of the times because I don't believe that what makes a scholar a scholar or what makes a person a scholar is when he continuously regurgitates what is already there. Mm. In my view, that doesn't make you a scholar. What makes somebody a scholar, in my view, is somebody who takes existing theory and challenges it. And not just challenge it for the sake of challenging mm -hmm. it, but proving his point that this thing that we have believed all this while is actually false and that this is what it ought to be so fundamentally saying something different that has not been known before or mm -hmm. that has not existed before in my view is what makes you a scholar oftentimes why i say it, it, it really shouldn't be controversial but the reason why i say controversy is because oftentimes when you do that you fall into a lot of trouble you know, you're not conforming. You are not conforming. You know, everybody <laughs> likes everybody to conform to what they already know. Mm -hmm. And you know, when people imbibe a certain knowledge for decades or for centuries, 
and then somebody comes with new knowledge that challenges their existing beliefs. In communication studies, it's called dissonance. What they experience a certain dissonance, yeah. a certain discomfort in themselves. And now when people are dissonant, when they experience dissonance, they do two things. One, they could attack the source of the dissonance. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. In that case, you. Mm -hmm. You, the person who has brought them new knowledge and saying that what they have already known is not the reality or is not the truth. They would attack you and so on without even examining the merits of the matter that you are talking about. Or a more reasonable people will take it and go back and try to see whether indeed what they have learned all over the years. But the majority of people actually attack the source of the mm. dissonant information. Mm. And that's why I say that um, I love controversy, because oftentimes all the research and the papers that I have presented, even as a lecturer in university, have always challenged existing knowledge. And most of the time, I get attacks mm. from people, especially for, uh, for somebody who is a, a student of Islam. You know, Islam, assumes a certain certainty, mm -hmm. okay? And so anybody who wants to challenge that certainty is seen as a heretic. Sometimes you are labeled an unbeliever. There's a time <laughs> I remember I delivered a lecture at the University of Cape Coast. This was in 2010. Mm -hmm. And then it's also on gender. Okay. It, the, the title was uh, Muslim Women in Sacred and Profane Spaces divine sanction or male conspiracy. After the lecture, <laughs> some students actually went to the mosques to go and chastise me and say that on the day of judgment, I'm going to be in the bottommost part of hell and that the crowds that gathered at the lecture to cheer me up were going to be placed on me in the, in the fire of hell and etc. etc. But I understand these things. But later on, some people get to say, wow, what you are saying is true. It's, it, it's true. So that's me. Wow. 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 And that's why, and that's why we are here. And before I forget, he's the Minister for Information as well. And I think his uh, accounts will say, Fufuwa Tonkwem, the guy wants to give information. There you go. Handle the ministry. But is governance as difficult? I mean, everybody knows that, oh, well, it's easier you know, when you're outside of government and you're pointing directions. But once you get in, is it actually more difficult than, you know, when you're outside? For sure. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Um, Golda Meir, I'm, I'm sure that's how her name is pronounced, was once an Israeli prime minister. And she says that the picture is always different from afar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even our driving mirrors mm. tell us that objects may be uh, closer than closer they appear. Than they appear. <laughs> <laughs> so, quite frankly, yes. Mm. When you come into governance, um, you realize and know that uh, the dynamics of actually running a state are, are not as easy as perhaps you would perceive when you have not gotten an opportunity um, to be in there. And so I, I see, realize, I, I now realize that many people who have been ministers of state, for example, before, or important state actors, oftentimes when they are no longer there and they are criticizing others who have come after them, they are more tampered, you know, mm -hmm. in their criticism than those who are yet to come. Who haven't been there <laughs> before. So, but that is what it is. That's the answer. It's, 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 it's always, it's, it's more difficult um, in the inside than, than it is on the outside. Okay, now, <clears throat> I, I ran my little republic, right? And obviously you are dealing with human beings. And it's very challenging, you know, for that, just a few of us. So um, I'm going to multiply it again. Now you need to manage 30 million people, different cultures, different intellects, different understanding, different appreciation. But yet still, your justice rule, your equity rule, everything has to be the same. I mean, how, how is that manageable? <sighs> that, that's a difficult call. I'm sure 
um, before we started this interview, you saw that there were people mm. already waiting. Mm -hmm. Before I get to this office at 8.30 or 9 a.m., there are scores of people already lined up and waiting for you. In the course of a day, the minimum number of people that you would see would be between 20 and 30 people. I run an open day on Wednesdays, and it's, it's now become general knowledge that, oh, Mustafa operates an open door on Wednesday. Now, on Wednesdays, sometimes I can see up to 60, 70 people. Wednesdays, sometimes I live here at 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Because once you are in here, they would never say it is late, let's go home and come. They would stay till you see the last person. And now, meanwhile, in the course of seeing people, you're supposed to be working also. As Minister for Information, you're supposed to be answering calls from radio stations. You're supposed to be writing rejoinders, directing people what to do, reading um, media monitoring reports, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes having to dash as the presidential spokesperson, also having to dash to the Flagstaff House to be part of some ceremonies that the president is in, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's really very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I basically have to be juggling maybe five or six balls in the air at the same time and, and hoping that none of them drops and so on. And with the human being, it's more com human beings, it's more complex because it's difficult to tell them you won't see them. You know, you know what they say, <laughs> that politics is about people, it's mm -hmm. about numbers. Mm -hmm. So if you don't see somebody, you can go around and say, hey, this minister, is <laughs> after we voted for him and he became minister, he's become arrogant, he doesn't see people, et cetera, et cetera. Even if you have explained to him that you can't see him because of so-so and so reason, they are, they are simply not bothered at all. Mm. So it's, it's quite a difficult call. But, you know, um, I also realize that the world is such that people don't have to like you for any reason, nor do they have to hate you for any reason. People just hate or like you because there has to be hate and there has to be like. Mm. You know, what is important is that you do your work according to your conscience and be sure that you are doing right by your conscience. Once you are doing right by your conscience, you don't have to bother about who likes you and who, do who doesn't like you. Because it is not possible, no matter how you behave, for everybody to like you. I guess you're right. <clears throat> I don't know if this works in the Islam culture but you know in christianity they ask you oh, when did you become born again i'm asking you that because i know you are a very religious person you mean one of the things i admired about you back then was because of how religious you were so i mean when did you become born again you know what's born again islam well um if there's such a thing yeah <laughs> my father I've, I've, um, was a very strict disciplinarian mm. very very strict disciplinarian and i mean that to the core. Mm. He was a soldier and a very devout Muslim. So I started to do the Ramadan fast at age six. Wow. At age seven, I was already calling the Azan for the dawn prayer in our area at Sakasaka in Tamale. At seven. My father would wake me up at 4.30 a.m. every day, religiously. And the first thing that you do when you rise from the mattress is to go grab a buta and a toothbrush and then go and brush your teeth and perform ablution and head straight to the mosque. So I would call the azan at 4.30 and call the azan again at about 4.55, about a few minutes to 5. And then at 5, the people in the area would gather around and they would say the prayer in a little mosque in uh, the late Alaji Zeblim's house. Um, he so rest in peace. So um, that was your little seven-year-old voice blurting through the, through the area. Th yeah, because, and, and my father would ensure that wherever I went by 6 p.m., I'm back in the house, perform ablution, go to the mosque. So I was already compelled. At that time, I'll call it compulsion, mm -hmm. quite frankly, because it's not, it's not a choice that mm -hmm. I made. <laughs> so I was compelled to observe congregational prayer at least three times a day. The dawn prayer, the maghrib, which is the evening prayer, and then the isha, 
which is the late night prayer. Then Monday to Friday, I would go to school at the Station Experimental Primary School. Then Saturday, Sunday, I would go to Makaranta at Manhalia Arabic School, Arabic and Islamic School. Um, it's near, um, it's at a place called Kaladan Barracks in Tamale. It used to be, it was founded by one Alhaji Isabello, who is also late. May his soul rest in peace. So Saturday morning, so I, I didn't have a rest day for seven, from age six all the way till about age 12, 11, 12. I would go to school Monday to Friday and go to Makaranta Sunday, Saturday, Sunday. No rest. Did, did you have siblings? No, I, I was alone basically ah. with my father. What happened was that my father and mother divorced when I was about three, four years. Um, after me, they gave birth to my younger brother, Buftao, who died in infancy as, as a baby. I didn't even, I wasn't conscious of him actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was told later that there was a younger brother, Muftao, and I have his childhood pictures or his baby pictures. And then he died. And so it was me alone, and then they got divorced. So when they divorced, my father took me, and then my mother went off um, to go and marry elsewhere. So I was living with my father all these years that I'm talking about with you for a very long time. Wow. You know, so it was just me and him, you know, so I would go to the market, go and buy the ingredients for cooking and everything, come and set the fire. And then as a soldier, he would close from work at about 2 mm -hmm. p.m. And then he would come home and do the cooking, do the soup, do the stew and so on. My father was actually um, enlisted into the army as an army cook. Okay. Okay, okay yeah. so my father is a very good cook, cooks well, and so he would come did you, did and, you learn? and do the cooking. I learned some of it, but quite <laughs> frankly, I didn't become adept at it the way that he did. Okay. Yeah. And so I ran, he ran me through, if you want, a strict regiment. Mm. Okay, you wake up 4.30, you go to the mosque, you come at 5.00. You clean the house, you sweep, mop the chairs, everything. By the time it's about 5.30, 6 a.m., it's, it's, it's daybreak. Then you go and buy cocoa. You come, you drink the cocoa, have your bath. And then he puts me on, the, on his motorbike, drops me off at the lorry station. And then the school bus will come and take me to, to, to the Kamina Barracks, Station Experimental Primary School. Regimental. Very regimental. And then when school closes at... 2 p.m. He tells you that in 30 minutes, you must be home. A minute after that, when he comes, you have the soldier's belt <laughs> raining on you, you know. So everything is timed. And then I have playtime only once every week, which was Saturdays. So Saturday, when I close from Makaranta at 2, he expects me to be home by 3.30. 3.30, then he'll give you an opportunity. Okay, you can go and play up to 5.30. 5.30, sharp. You must be back in the house and take your bath and heading towards the mosque. You know, so that's how up to now I'm still very impatient with people who don't respect time, because my father drilled it mm. into me. And when you look around my office, you see it's littered with pens. Mm. My greatest possession on earth, apart from books, are pens. That also was drilled into me by my father. You know, <laughs> if my father comes home and you are sitting idle, you are not holding a book, he doesn't ask questions. He just goes for his soldier's belt and starts shipping. Sweet. <laughs> Even if you read it, just If you just read it. There was one day I remember uh, my auntie called Ai. She's the wife of the chief of Kumbungu now as we speak. And she, she, she had gone out with my father. And I, I stopped reading and I went out to play with the area boys. And then when I heard the motto, the sound of the motto, I quickly ran back into the house and took the book, pretending to be reading. Apparently, I had turned the book upside down. And I didn't realize because I wasn't reading. And then they came in. Oh, he looked down and then he realized I had turned the book. So he knew I wasn't reading before he came. He went and took the soldier's belt. Started. So my auntie said to him, please, soldier, take your time. You see what you've done to the boy. Let me take, you a, know. Let me take, let me take a break here. <laughs> We're coming straight back. I told you, this is the favorite part. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you very much for staying up close and personal with uh, Dr. Mustafa Abdul Hamid, Minister for Information. Uh, Doc, it's quite interesting that. Quite an interesting that. Uh, did, did he make you paranoid? Yes, quite we, frankly. We, we, we've seen a, a collection of, of his pens. I mean, definitely, if, if nothing at all. <laughs> quite frankly, you know, at, at that time, in, in those years, Quite frankly, I used to sit down in my own quiet moments. And if you want, basically curse God and say, why did you make this man my father? You know, all these children are around the area, they are free to go out and play football and do as they please. They don't have to go to Makaranta. They don't have to do all the things that I have to do. And they never have to wash dishes and iron clothes. And, and so on and so forth. So, quite frankly, I, I um, to put it bluntly, I didn't quite li like my father. Mm. It's difficult to say you don't like <laughs> your father. But I didn't like him, quite frankly. You know, but now, sitting back and looking at how my life has evolved. You couldn't have had a better father. Oh, master. <laughs> I, 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 I'm in love with him. And, and I thank God for his life. Um, is, is he alive? Yes, he's alive. Oh my he, goodness! He's great. In, in 1985, he he had to go into exile because okay. he had troubles with the then PNDC mm -hmm. government, uh, military government, you know, and then went into exile. But he's still alive. He was home recently, and he's gone back to London. Now his base is in London. I'm okay. sure in the next few years he will pack up and come back to stay at home. But so but at least you you, you you live to say thank you to him. Oh, absolutely. And <laughs> almost every year when it's Father's Day, that's all I say to him. <laughs> because all the habits that make me were inculcated in me by him. Right now, for those who know me, one thing they can always tell you is that Mustafa Hamid is time conscious. He doesn't joke with his time. That's my father. Mm -hmm. Mustafa Hamid's like book and knowledge. That's my father. Mustafa Hamid likes pens. That's my father. Nobody irons Mustafa Hamid's clothes. He does his ironing by himself. That's my father. Because, you know, those times the military uniform was called OG. It's not the camouflage that they wear these days. The OG was this green, all green, thick, thick uniform. And he would do the washing himself, and then I would starch it. And you know those days, it was not starch spray. Raw cassava starch, which I would boil. And then, you know, mix with some water, dilute it a bit, put the clothes in, then take them out and then dry them. And then when it is dry, then you have to now come and iron the OG, OG uniform. As a young boy of seven, eight, I was already ironing OG. That's and he would stand on pressing, me. As they yes, call it. they call it pressing. Press, exactly. Press it. <laughs> you know, because you would have to regulate the heat to the fullest that you can. Mm -hmm. And then you had, um, you would put soap in, in water and then get it for me. And then you put a sponge in it. So then you would basically brush the sponge over the thing and then... You know, as a young boy, I had to. So up to date, I iron on the floor. Wow. Because if you iron on an ironing board, you could break the iron because you have to apply <laughs> so all your strength, you know, to be able to iron the OG. And so I went through that kind of training. So today, anybody who irons my dress, I, I, I don't find it well ironed. So I do my that's own own ironing. And, and, and that's also my father. And so, quite frankly, I believe and this is with, with the greatest of humility, that I have turned out well. Mm. I, I believe I've turned out well. I, I believe that I, I am quite useful to society. Sure. And I give that credit to my father. Wow. So at Boku Secondary, by this time you've left that, was it for you like who freedom? Or by that time you had been so indoctrinated positively that yeah. you were unable to break free? You know, what happened was that he went into exile when I was in secondary school from two. Okay. That's when he went into exile. I went to secondary school at the age of 11. Um, from P6, I wrote the common entrance exam at that mm -hmm. time. And then, you know, in those days, mm -hmm. even if you were two years and you could write common mm -hmm. entrance and pass, you would, you would go to secondary school. <laughs> so I wrote the common entrance um, in 1982. Um, I was born in 71, 
So 71 to 82, that makes it mm -hmm. about 11 yeah. years. Yeah, and then I passed the common entrance. And he asked me to choose Boko Secondary School because my father comes from Widana. Widana is in the um, Boko district, that, that, mm -hmm. that area. It is actually the last town before you enter Togo, the Togolese town of Sankansi. Okay. You know, so, and he's a Bisa, what ordinarily people call Busanga. Okay. To date, I don't speak Bisa, and that's unfortunate. But at that time, he said that I should go to Boku Secondary School because it's a Bisa area. And, be, and perhaps because of the influence of other students, Bisa students in Boku Secondary School, Pick up the I language. will get to, 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 to speak <laughs> their language. And so that's how come he shipped me off to, to, to Boku Secondary School. Then all of a sudden in 1985, April vacation, I came home. The house was empty. He had basically fled into exile because he was accused of plotting to overthrow, I mean, of course, with other mm. officers to overthrow um, the, the military regime of the PNDC. At that point, life became very, very unbearable for me because at that time, my father was the Russian man, what others would call the store man, mm -hmm. for all the garrisons in the Tamale area. There was Kaladan Barracks, there was the Armed Forces Recruiting Training School at Nyohene, there was Kamina Barracks, there was Bawa Barracks, which is the Airborne Force. My father was the Russian man for all of these garrisons, and so food was not our, our problem. Mm. We had always a storehouse of everything, sugar, milk, yam, everything. So when I was going to um, secondary school, you know, I had a good chop box. Chop box is nice. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. You know, but when he fled into exile, then as they say, things fell apart. Whoa. Because I was left alone. My mother had gone to marry another man, but she was struggling, even with my other siblings that she's giving birth to in her other marriage. You know, she was struggling to take care of those other siblings. So there was no way she, she had the resources mm. to take me over. So I went to live with my father's elder brother. He's still alive, very old now and frail, um, called Baba Isaka, near the Afajures Mosque in, in Tamale, in Sakazaka. He was, he was a watchman. <laughs> you can imagine his circumstances, living in very small rented apartment in, in Sakazaka. So I, I went to live with him. And life was difficult. Wow. So even money to, to, to go to school when school reopens was a problem. So my shito from then on was made with share butter. And so anytime I wanted to eat my shito, I would have to go from Livingston House in Boku Secondary School all the way to the kitchen. This would be a distance of about 500, 600 meters to go and melt the shito. You know, share butter mm. coagulates, yeah. uh, you know, and then melts and then come back to, to Livingston House to be able to dish my shito and eat it. Money to buy uniform was a problem. So I would go to the, the first line, as they say, and then buy a pink shirt. One day I remember I entered the classroom and everybody was beside themselves with laughter. They were laughing. Quack, 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 quack. Now, now, you know why? Apparently I was wearing a lady's shirt. <laughs> you bought a blouse? Yes. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> At that time, I didn't know the difference between the, but they a left man's the shirt <laughs> and a lady's shirt, and they were laughing. So I was amazed. When classes closed, I asked, I went, there's this beautiful lady at that time called Rebecca Pam. I went to ask Rebecca Pam, why is it that when I entered the class, everybody was laughing at me? She said, the shirt you're wearing is a lady's shirt. <laughs> so I had to rush to the dormitory to take it off and then borrow another friend's <laughs> shirt. And work. So I'm making the point that I, from then on, I basically had to struggle, wow. you know, to finish secondary school. And so at that time, so there wasn't that instant like, oh, thank God, now I'm away from home. Let me go. Let me now have my freedom. Exactly, yeah. because well, now I was free, <laughs> but but as they say, not free, because now the economic circumstances and everything mm -hmm. that was supposed to make life a bit bearable for me were all gone, and so it it was a hassle, mm. okay. And that's how come I also developed a very beautiful handwriting. Because what will happen is that now I would borrow my friend's book 
we used to have some famous books like Economics Without Tears, um, Principles of Modern Government, mm -hmm. etc. So I would go and borrow your book and say, can I read, can you give me three, four days to read this book? And what I would then do is that I would go and buy exercise books and actually sit through the night. So I started sitting through the night from say 8 p.m. till 5 a.m. when I was in secondary school from three. And I would sit through the night and copy the whole pamphlet. Sometimes it would take me three, four exercise books to copy the entire economics without tears wow. with my hand. And you know, as you are copying, you are basically reading it. Mm. Mm. You know, mm. so I believe that that's what also somehow made me a bright student because up until that point, I wasn't really, quite frankly, a very bright student. You know, but after my father also went into exile and I faced this hardship and I had to adopt these methods mm. of learning. And I basically said to myself, now I don't have anybody in the world anymore. It's just me and myself. And therefore, the, the books are my way to salvation. And so I would copy these books and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden in secondary school from, from four, things began to change. And I just came on top of the class just like that. <laughs> you know, so the point I'm trying to make is that in life, you never know. Um, they say that um, every, every misfortune is a blessing. That's what they mm -hmm. say. But I believe that that is true because the misfortune, what befell me with the exile of my father also brought in uh, a lot of good things. So, I mean, at, at the time, did you have the mind that, look, I'm going to leave here, I'm going into politics? At that time, rather, what I thought I wanted to do is that I said I was also going to go to the army and be an army officer. After all, after all you've mastered the timing already. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so my ambition was to finish SIFOM because I didn't want to be an OR, mm. what they call other rank, mm -hmm. you know, mm. private, last corporal, those kinds mm. of things. No, because right from the beginning, my father had been telling me that he wanted me to be a soldier, but he wanted me to be an army officer. So, because he kept saying, I've been saluting people throughout my life. I want you to be saluted. You know? <laughs> yeah, so he said he was giving me that training so that I would grow to become an army officer so that other people will salute me also. So, but after he went into exile, it increased my resolve to actually be an army officer. Because actually, coups were the in thing mm. in those days. So I said, okay, let me also go to the army <laughs> and organize a coup, overthrow the PNDC, <laughs> No, and then my father, my father can bring come. My father back. Exactly. So that that was my ambition, quite frankly. And 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 so. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Frankly, frankly. And so then after Sifom, I tried the recruitment. Once I didn't get, it. I wasn't picked. Tried the second one, I wasn't picked. And so I was compelled to go to university. So the next year I filled the university form and then I went to the university. But even whilst in university, overthrowing PNDC was still on my mind. But fortunately, when we entered university in 91, the PNDC announced a timetable for lifting the ban on politics. So in 1991, um, the various groups that intended to form political parties formed what they called clubs. Mm -hmm. I remember three, three prominent, they, these three prominent traditions, the PNDC tradition, the Dankwa Buzia tradition, and then the CPP tradition founded, the, the MPP people founded what they called the Dankwa Buzia club. Mm -hmm. The CPP had the heritage club, and then the NDC group had the Eagle club. So they founded these clubs as preparatory organizations, mm -hmm. you know, towards becoming full-blown political parties. And so they came to the universities to, to recruit young people to form their membership and so on. So I remember one lawyer, Spiel, he's late in the central region. He, he led the organization of the Dankwa Buzia Club in the central region. So he came to the University of Cape Coast, and then some of us wrote our names under the Dankwa Buzia Club. You know, because of course the Eagle Club was out for me because I said to myself, these people, you have to overthrow them. we have to overthrow them. <laughs> this time, not through the gun. But I saw, so I joined the Dankwa Buzia Club and mm -hmm. wrote my name. And then in 1992, 
you know, the ban on politics was lifted. This was 18th May 1992. And then these clubs became political parties. Mm. Heritage Club became People's Heritage Party. And then the Eagle Club at that time split into two. They had the NDC party, uh, that's National Democratic Party, mm -hmm. and the Eagle Party. You know, and then that Kwabuzia Club became New Patriotic mm -hmm. Party. Mm -hmm. So I remember that 18th May, the 9th of 18th May, 1992, I walked all the way from the Kisley Ford Hall in UCC to Victoria Park, which is now called the Jubilee Park in Cape Coast, you know, just to witness the bonfire night that ushered in the formation of the NPP. And so I became, as they say in Ghana, a foot soldier of the New Patriotic Party. And so when they vacated, we went home, and then I began to mount the platforms. I'll tell you how I began to mount platforms. I went to an MPP rally at the taxi rank in Tamale. Mm -hmm. And then I watched the rally. When they finished the rally, the late Mustafa Idris, he was once minister under President Kofo. He, he, he was at the rally and spoke. So after the rally, I approached him and I said, oh, I'm a first year student at the University of Cape Coast. I'm a member of the party at Cape Coast. And I came to, um, to see this rally. I believe that, <laughs> it was quite arrogant of a small boy, but I said to him that I believe that I'm a better speaker than all the people who spoke at this rally except you. <laughs> so I believe that if you put me on the platform, I can I'll do. he that. said, really? He said, yes. Then he said, okay, the next day we have a rally at Sabonjida. So come to the Sabonjida rally. So I went to the Sabonjida rally and then he put me on the platform. Oh, master. You cheered the crowd. <laughs> and as they say, the rest is history. history. And then so I, from there, I had no rest at all. So now... <laughs> People would hear from me uh, about me in Yendi, Chiriponi, so everywhere. So they would come, we have a rally in Yendi. Yeah, then they'll come, Mustafa <laughs> Ami, then they'll come and take me to Yendi. So I was all over. So in 1992, you know, by the end of the campaign, I was already popular across the northern region, you know, for my political uh, involvement in the, in the NPP and so on and so on. So that's how come on and on mm -hmm. and on I became national youth organizer of the party, spokesperson for then candidate Akufuado mm -hmm. for 10 years and now Minister for Information. Yeah. So how, how did you bump into Akufuado? What's, what's the relationship? Because I know you guys go back. Yeah, um, I was national youth organizer of the party. Mm -hmm. And one day after a national executive committee meeting at the party headquarters at Kokom Limli, up until that point, I just know him as a leading figure of the party. Mm. He comes to UCC to address us as students and so on. But I wasn't close with him. Mm. But after the meeting, this was in 2005. After the meeting, it must have been around March, early March, February, March of 2005. And then he, he said to me, young man, I want to see you tomorrow. And I said, oh, okay. Then I'll come. Where's your house? He said, oh, he lives at East Legon near the Muslim mm -hmm. Cemetery. I should just ask Akufuado. So the next morning I went. And then he said to me that he's been observing me. And he thinks that I'm a brilliant guy. I, I, he thinks that I have a resource that uh, the party can use and that he can use. And he said to me, you know, I have presidential ambitions. I said, of course I know. <laughs> because by then he had contested the ND MPP primaries in 1998. Mm -hmm. So, of course, his ambition was known. And I said, of course, your ambition is known. And he said, okay, I want you to come and help me, work with me to become president so that I can also help you to grow in politics. I had no hesitation at all. That very morning in his house, I said to him, we have a deal. deal. We are together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then from there, together with other people, we began to do the ground mobilization for his ambition until 2007 when he retired sorry resigned as minister for foreign affairs mm -hmm. and came to join us at the phone office at circle and again as they say the rest is history the rest is history do, do, do you think your debate in school because in school days you know i've seen a picture of you you know in full flight debating yeah. uh did, did it come back to help very well very well um, but Nana, let me say something mm. that um, some people may also um, say, ah, but how can an Islamic scholar 
believe in that. But I believe that we, we were not just made. I believe that creation is purposeful, okay? And that there's a reason why somebody is born in June and another person is born in March and another person is born in December. In other words, I believe in the stars, mm. okay? Mm -hmm. And so I'm a June born. I was born 14th June, 1971. And therefore that makes me a Gemini. And I believe that m the overwhelming majority of Geminis speak well. You know, they are, they are natural communicators. Geminis communicate very well. Thinking. <laughs> they tend to be politicians, teachers, lecturers, actors and actresses, marketing and salespeople, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that my articulation and eloquence is natural. It's natural to my birth. And so because I just joined the debating club in Tamale Secondary School, just like that. I, and incidentally, that's where you're supposed to be. I'll take a quick break here and we'll come back and find out where the laugh from Che Guevara comes in. I find it uh, very disconnecting, but I'm sure there's a connection somewhere. Don't go. <music> Thank you very much for staying, and it's just getting very, very interesting. But uh, as I came into the doctor's office, I realized that, you know, there's a lot of Che Guevara paraphernalia, and I just want to find out what it is. Because an MPP man would completely say, no, 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 not this revolutionarist. That's not my style. Considering somebody who's going to go to the army, to become a soldier, to clear a revolutionary <laughs> government, you think, you know, what, what's the connection with Che Guevara? You know, when I finished um, sixth form mm. and I was awaiting results, in the period of awaiting results between June and September mm. um, 1989, I got under the influence of um, two key personalities in Tamale. One was called Sohien Mbangba and then uh, Ilyasu Adam. Um, these were, if you want, left-wing activists. And we used to hold a study club in Suhien and Bangbe's house where we study socialist and communist material. You know, what is surplus value, what is capitalism, you know, exploitation of the masses, labor, etc., etc. So I learned all of these things, and most of the icons of socialism and revolution would be Karl Marx, you know, Angels, um, even uh, Fidel, etc., etc. And so I read, I got to read the biography of Che Guevara, and I loved it. Why did I love it? I loved the sacrifice. He was born into quite rich circumstances. He was a medical doctor. He could have practiced his medicine in Argentina and, and lived a comfortable life. But he left Argentina to go around the world, basically fighting to establish socialist governments, you know, and, and overthrow oppressive, if you want, capitalist governments mm -hmm. and so on. And, you know, he came all the way to Congo, you know, in mm -hmm. DR Congo, to also fight alongside, at that time, the late Kabila, Joseph Kabila's mm. father, and so on. But he left Congo because, at that time, his view was that Kabila was not a proper revolutionary, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So I fell in love with him, the, the, the spirit of sacrifice, that people can sacrifice their comfort for other people's sake, and eventually dying in the jungles of Bolivia, you know, and, and so on. That kind of attracted me. And I said, this is who I want to be in the future. I want to be somebody who is constantly fighting for the masses, who, is, who has a sense of sacrifice, and so on. So these qualities are what 
endeared me to Che Guevara. And that's how come I began to collect his pictures and his photographs adorned my house, my office. <laughs> you know, I read his biography. For the sense of sacrifice. Yes, the sense of sacrifice. And then, the, 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 if you want, the philosophy that we ought to establish a regime of social justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you have five lovely children. I mean, you're a very strong man. That I'm sure you get from your daddy too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely, without a doubt, without a uh, doubt. Now, how how are you splitting your time between these kids and this demanding job? Um, it's it's a very difficult matter, um, but you know, quite frankly, the way that my father trained me, I'm unable to train my children like that. Again, it is typical Gemini behavior. I, I am unable to even whip a child, okay? But rather, I, I talk, you know, I talk. Try and negotiate. And try and negotiate <laughs> and get them to understand. But every now and then, I recall my history to them and what I go to. Fortunately, grandfather comes around sometimes and he tells them, he says, hey, you can ask your father. At the age of six, he was already fasting. You guys must fast. You guys must do this. You guys must do this. You must iron your own clothes. Your daddy was doing that, and etc., etc. I tried the little time that I have to be able to talk to them and teach them mm -hmm. what will make them better people and so on. But I don't believe that, quite frankly, I have the kind of tenacity my father had uh, to be able to train them the way that my, my dad did. But I, I believe that they are, they, are, they are turning out well. Even though <coughs> Do you miss, you uh, miss your days uh, lecturing? Very much. Very, <laughs> very, very much. And if you look on the door to my back, mm. I've pinned a certain paper there that I've written on it, abstract, with a research topic. Mm. Um, every so often, at least, Every semester, I try to carve a research topic, and I do the research, and I write the paper, and I go to one of our universities, mostly Islamic University mm -hmm. or University of Cape Coast, to deliver a lecture. So even on, I think, April 8th, I'll be going back to University of Cape Coast to deliver a, 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 a lecture. Okay. And my favorite topic is always about Islam and politics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, if you look there, I have the topic that I've carved. I've called it Sufla and Uliya. You know, the paradox of the conceptions of political power in Muslim communities in Ghana. You know, so I miss lecturing. Mm. And all of the time, I want an opportunity, even whilst I am minister, to continue to contribute will you, will you to, go back to academic the discourse. Without a doubt. <laughs> right now, the University of Cape Coast has given me a four-year leave without pay. Okay. Um, if the four years is over, I may, depending on what the president mm -hmm. tells me, I may go back to the classroom and continue to do what is my first love. Wow. Okay. So now, the, the, uh, I, I know when you were, uh, how do I put it? A Muslim by force. I wanted to, I wanted yes. to find out, when did you become a Muslim by will? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. You know, um, quite frankly, my zeal and, 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 and passion for, for Islam, mm. actually, I would trace it to 2009, quite frankly, when I began to teach Islam mm. in the university. Because at that time, now I was researching and turning the scriptures up, upside down and questioning beliefs mm -hmm. and, and so on. And in doing that, it kind of rekindled my faith and zeal in Islam as Islam. Not Islam as was taught to me by Imams and Malams and so on. Now I have the chance, I had the chance to examine the scriptures myself and convince myself about the beliefs that I held and those that I thought really did not have a basis. I, I jettisoned <laughs> them and so on. You know, people tend to think that the more you get to know, the, the less religious you will be. So most of the times 
both, and it happens both in Christianity and in Islam. Mm. They tell you, oh, don't ask too many questions. Sanet here, you know, it's a mystery. You can't understand it. Just believe. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think that we should allow people to explore the scriptures. Every believer has a right to read the scriptures themselves and interpret it themselves and understand it according to their conscience. Because listen, Nana, there is no objective interpretation anywhere in the world. Every interpreter of a text comes to the text with his or her own subjectivities. Are you following me? Yeah. Ma <coughs> mark my, my mm -hmm. quote. There is no objective interpretation anywhere. Every interpreter comes to a text with his or her own subjectivities. Recently, there is some brouhaha in the public space about a certain research that Professor Atuguba has, has put out, which is causing some mm -hmm. consternation in the society. I don't see what new Professor Atuguba is saying. If I'm a conservative, my conservative beliefs will influence the way that I interpret the Quran. If I'm a liberal, my liberal orientation would influence the way that mm -hmm. I interpret the Quran. There is absolutely no doubt yeah. about it. There is no doubt yeah. about it. Otherwise, why? Why do we have Catholicism, Anglican, Methodism, etc.? Why do we have Shia, Tijaniya, Ahmadiyya, Sunni? Why do we have that? They are the all, same book. Yeah. They are all products of interpretation. And so, really and truly, nobody should be forcing a single brand of religion on anybody. Because it is not possible. Allah says in the Quran, if I had wished, I would have made all of you one community. But I allow you to wallow in your differences, which I shall settle on the day of judgment. Uh, not when you're dead. No, that's too far. But maybe when you're about 70, by now you're more relaxed doing just one lecture a month. What do you want to be remembered for? Because I believe as a legacy hunter, at least live to see some of your legacy, not when you're dead and gone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in, in academia, I want to be able to publish an F-shaking thesis, if you want, an F-shaking book, a book that will challenge um, existing beliefs and which will, if you want, alter the discourse. And that is what I want to be remembered for. You know, um, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, tells us that um, knowledge is one thing that never dies. If you plant the tree of knowledge, people would continue to feed in it. And it is something that you get the reward for, even if you are dead. Allah continues to reward you from the knowledge that you have planted, which people continue to feed from. And that's what I want to do. In governance, one morning when I walk out of the, the, this ministry, I want to be able to walk out, leaving certain fundamental footmarks that when people come back here 50 years from now, would say, Mustafa Hamid did this, Mustafa Hamid did that. MPP so far in government, and this is a very big question and very unfair because you have just about 30 seconds. Is there something you would have done differently? I believe so far everything that we have done is the way that we're supposed to do it. There have been challenges and so on, but we are just one year in governance. I believe that we have a huge opportunity to correct these challenges as we go on. But quite frankly, there's nothing that I regret so far. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doc. Indeed, I am very honored. And uh, I thought it was a very selfish interview. I just wanted to know these things for myself. And I hope to God, uh, as you are in the house, you also wanted to know Dr. Mustafa Abdul Hamid, Minister for Information. Until next Friday, that I come to you with a different uh, personality. I always give you this number. 024-366-2001. 024 024-366-2001. 366-2001. They make my shirts for the show, so give Tanties a call. Until next Friday, have a beautiful week.